Number 10, The Dog Boy. The small town of Quitman, located in Cleburne County, Arkansas, is known for its rich history and, and picturesque Victorian era homes. However, among these charming homes lies a dark history that has led to the town being known for its haunted houses. One such house is the Beatus House, a large home on Mulberry Street. This house has had a long and troubled history dating back to the late 19th century. The house was originally built by the Garrett family in the late 1800s. It was a grand and impressive home, and for many years it was the pride of the Quitman. However, in the early 1950s, the house was sold to the Beatty's family. The Beatty's family, consisting of Floyd and Aileen, were childish for many years until they had a son in 1954 named Gerald Floyd Beatty's. Gerald Beatty's was a difficult child from an early age, and he was known for being very vicious and cruel to others. He also had a strange interest in collecting stray animals and later torturing them. Then as he grew older, his behavior became more sinister, and he allegedly kept his elderly parents imprisoned in the upstairs part of the house, where he would only feed them when he decided it was time for them to eat. He was also known for physically abusing his father and throwing him out of an upstairs window on one occasion. It is believed by the locals that the spirits of the Garrett family, along with the spirit of Gerald Beatty's, still haunt the house to this day. The haunt has been vacant for many years and local residents avoid it at all costs. Number 9, The Boggy Creek Monster The small town of Falk, Arkansas has long been captivated by the legend of the Boggy Creek Monster. According to the local legend, the creature, said to be between 7 to 8 feet tall and weighing around 300 pounds, is covered in thick long hair and has been spotted roaming the area for over a century. The first reported sightings date back to 1834, with a surge in sightings around folk in the 1900s. In 1997 alone, residents reported spotting the monster more than 40 times. The creature is often thought to be nocturnal, but one hunter even reported a sighting in broad daylight in the Sulphur River Wildlife Area near Falk in 2000. The legend of the Boggy Creek Monster has been the subject of several films, with the most notable being 1973's The Legend of Boggy Creek. The movie, which centers around a supposed encounter with the beast by Bobby Ford, was most likely shot on location in Falk and brought the legend to the attention of millions of people. The film also brought an economic boost to the region, with many cast members being locals or nearby college students. The famous encounter that the film is based on actually occurred in 1971. The Fords claimed that the Boggy Creek monster attacked their home late on the night of May 1st. According to Elizabeth Ford, the creature reached through her screen window but was chased away by Bobby and his brother Dan. Unsatisfied, the monster reportedly returned shortly after midnight and tossed Bobby to the ground. Bobby was taken to the St. Michael Hospital in Texarkana and treated for large gashes across his back. Although no traces of blood were found at the Ford's home, three toed footprints were found near the house, there were scratches on the porch, and the siding and a window were both damaged. Number 8 Railroad Track Lights There is a supposed haunted railroad track in Crowset, Arkansas, and after many reports, it has now become a hot spot for paranormal enthusiasts. According to the locals, a ghostly light appears to move up and down the tracks as if it's being held by a disembodied Body spirits. Some local residents claim that the source of this ghostly light is the spirit of a man who was hit by a train and decapitated, and now his ghost walks these tracks searching for his head. This is what it kind of looks like. Oh my god, it's right. Daddy, I'm scared. No, I'm not kidding, Daddy, I swear. It's in the middle of the road. No, I'm not kidding. I'm not. Many people who have visited the tracks have reported strange encounters with the ghostly light. Some claim that when standing on the tracks, the light will come towards them, disappear, then reappear on the other side. There are many videos available online that capture this strange experience, but it is unclear if the light is just an ordinary sight on the track or if there's actually something paranormal going on in the area. Number 7, The Vanishing Hitchhiker In central Arkansas, there is a chilling ghost story that's commonly told around Halloween, introducing the tale of The Vanishing Hitchhiker. According to the legend, travelers on the dark road of Arkansas Highway 365 sometimes encounter a young girl walking in the pouring rain in a torn white dress while crossing one spooky bridge. Some say they have stopped to give the young girl a ride. Those who stop say that they pick her up and drive her to her nearby home. However, when they arrive, the drivers discover that the girl has suddenly disappeared. Those who choose to knock on the front door of the home the young girl takes them to learn from a woman who answers that the young girl used to live at the home but was killed in a car accident, and she usually regularly hitchhikes a ride home, according to legend. One man recalled the time this happened to him where he picked up the girl and even gave the girl his jacket. As expected, when they arrived, she disappeared, and when he went to the door, a woman answered, and he explained 
explain what had just occurred. The woman at the door said, quote, that young girl is my daughter who was killed years ago. She hitchhikes back home once a year. The young man then drove to the cemetery to see the young girl's grave. There he found his coat draped over her tombstone. Number six, the gauze row. Arkansas not only has haunted homes and stories, but they also have their own terrifying creatures. These were known as the gauze row. This monster is believed to be a massive 20 foot long creature with tusk and claws. But that's not even the most interesting part of them. On January 31st, 1897, the Arkansas Gazette, a popular newspaper of the time, published an article written by Albert Smithy that included the sketch of this creature, and also an account of the first known encounter with it. The encounter, as described by Smithy, took place in the Ozark Forest, where a man named William Miller was traveling through the tiny town of Blanco. Miller had heard reports of livestock and pets being found dead, so he formed the group to track down the predator. They eventually encountered a creature that was 20 feet long with tusk and claws, as well as a row of horns along its back and a tail that ended in a blade-like point. The group supposedly killed the beast, but the body that Miller swore he shipped to the Smithsonian never arrived. The eerie scream that was heard in the forest before the encounter, which sounded like a gaw row, gave the urban legend its name. There are several possible explanations for the legend of this creature. Smithy may have just wanted attention for claiming to know the details of this elusive creature, or the story may have been a case of mistaken identity. The tusk and horns could have belonged to a razorback pig, or since the creature was said to have emerged from the lake, an alligator could have been the culprit. But despite the lack of concrete evidence, the legend of the Gosro has continued to captivate the imagination of the citizens of Arkansas for over 125 years. It may be a tall tale, but you never know what could be lurking in those forests. In the hump of our list, we have the Eureka Springs. Eureka Spring, Arkansas is a small town that is known for its immense paranormal activity. While some see it primarily as a gorgeous little Victorian village and a wonderful place to react, others consider it a hotbed for paranormal activity and also one of the most haunted places in Arkansas. Both perspectives are valid, of course, but mostly Eureka Springs is complex, a place where a vibrant, quirky little town is overrun with hauntings. Don't let the cheery buildings and nice folks fool you. The souls of the departed lives in Eureka Springs too. One of the most famous haunted places in the town is the 1886 Crescent Hotel. The hotel has been featured on the Travel Channel and is famous for its haunted room 218, where the ghost of Michael, who fell to his death during the hotel's construction, is said to reside. Guests have reported feeling a presence in the room, and some have even claimed to have seen the ghostly figure of Michael himself. The entire Crescent Hotel is full of ghosts, partly because it was once used as a cancer hospital, complete with a morgue that is also one of the most haunted places on the grounds. Number four, the Allen House. The Allen House in Monticello, Arkansas is a beautiful 1906 Queen Anne Victorian style home, but it has a dark history that has made it a popular spot for ghost hunters and history enthusiasts alike. The house was built by local businessman Joe Lee Allen and was intended to be a showpiece in the town with impressive porch columns and neoclassical design with a touch of gothic decoration. Allen along with his wife and three daughters moved into the family home and for a while they were content. Allen's business ventures thrive and all was well until his death in 1917. Then in 1949, another tragedy happened that would cast a shadow over the house's majestic appearance. During the last week of 1948, daughter Liddell Allen poisoned herself after consuming mercury cyanide. The new year would begin on a dark note with Liddell's death. For nearly 40 years, her room was sealed off by her mother. Then after Mrs. Allen died in 1954, the home was sectioned into apartments and remained a rental property run by the Allen family. Tenants began seeing strange things and experiencing paranormal activity not long after they moved in. Shadowy figures would appear in photographs taken by residents and furniture was rearranged with no one having touched anything. Objects around the house would disappear into thin air and ever since the story of Liddell grew into urban legend and the Allen House was declared haunted by both residents and locals alike. Number three, the Cotter Bridge. The R.M. Ruthven Rainbow Arc Bridge, also known as the Cotter Bridge, is a man-made wonder located in the town of Cotter, North Arkansas. Built in 1930 and renovated in 2004, it spans the White River and is known for its architectural marvel, trout fishing, and natural beauty. But beneath its lovely trusses, the bridge is also home to some spooky legends and ghost stories that have been passed down through generations. One of the most popular legends of the Cotter Bridge is the ghostly children that play on it during some nights. 
Visitors have reported hearing their laughter and chatter, but when they look for the children, they just disappear. While there is no concrete evidence to prove that these children are ghosts, the eerie and mysterious nature of their presence have left many visitors wondering. Another chilling tale that surrounds the Cotter Bridge is the ghost of a woman who is said to be chased by hounds. Visitors have reported hearing her screams and the bang of the hounds, but when they look for the source, they see nothing. The identity of the woman remains unknown and the reason for her ghostly presence is also a mystery. Some say that she may have been the victim of a tragic event that occurred near the bridge, while others believe she may have been the spirit of someone who drowned in the White River below. Number 2. The Gurdon Light The Gurdon Ghost Light is a mysterious and unexplained phenomenon that has been observed and documented in the small town of Gurdon, Arkansas. The light, which is said to be an eerie white-blue color that sways back and forth and moves around on a horizon, has been reported by locals and tourists alike. One popular legend surrounding the light is that it's the ghost of a railway worker who was killed on the job. According to this theory, the ghost is said to be carrying a lantern and roaming the tracks searching for something. Another theory suggests that the light is the ghost of a railway worker who fell in front of a train and lost his head, and the light is coming from the lantern he carried in life as he searches for his missing head. While the true origins of the Gurdon Light ghost are unknown, there are a few natural theories as to what it might be. Some scientists have suggested it could be caused by highway lights reflecting through the trees, but historians and local residents disagree as the light has been reported since before the highway was even built. Number 1. The Pea Ridge National Military Park The Pea Ridge National Military Park in Arkansas is a place where history and a mystery collide. The battlefield is a haunting reminder of the brutal and bloody battle that took place here in 1960 during the Civil War. Here, the Confederate Army, outnumbered by the Union Army, fought bravely but ultimately lost the battle, resulting in the deaths of nearly 3,400 men and boys. Visitors to the battlefield have reported strange and eerie experiences that seem to be connected to the intense history of the place. Many have reported hearing cannon fire in the night, feeling strange presences following them around the battlefield, and hearing the shouts of boys who died on the bloody ground. The Confederate Army, made up of mostly boys, Texicans, and Missourians, were advancing north in hopes of capturing St. Louis in Missouri. They were exhausted, running low on feud and ammunition, and their spirits were dampened by early losses at Pea Ridge. Meanwhile, the Union Army, led by a commander who was considered more of a politician than a war tested general, rallied around a hot breakfast, proud of their success on the first day of battle, and glad to have faced down an army that significantly outnumbered them. The battle lasted for two days, March 6th through March 8th, and at 10.30 a.m. on the morning of March 8th, the Confederate Army began its retreat, and by that time, the smoke cleared, the battlefield was littered with the bodies of fallen soldiers. The eerie feeling of the battlefield may be due to the intense history, and considering that 3,400 people lost their lives here, it's not a surprise you may see at least one spirit. At a number 10 spot, we have the Headless Nun. It all began during the mid 18th century struggle between the Acadians and the British. In an effort to fend off the British, a French fort was constructed at a cove located in a place known today as French Fort Cove in New Brunswick. Among the Acadians transported to this location was a nun known as Sister Mary. Sister Mary was born in France and requested of her superiors that she be sent to Canada to help the Acadians. She was deeply devoted to the care of the ill and despaired for their well being. Sister Marie was in charge of a fund that was set up to assist the needs of the families, and it is said that she buried the money for safekeeping. One fateful night, while returning from assisting a very ill person, Sister Mary was attacked by an unknown person or persons. They demanded that she reveal the location of the buried money. Her unwillingness to cooperate with the attackers resulted in Sister Mary being beaten, and her head was severed from her body. The head was never found, hence the headless nun. Sister Marie's body was then returned to France, but her spirit remained here, unable to rest until her head was buried with her body. Then for years after this incident, late night visitors to the area have reported being approached by Sister Marie's spirit, asking where her head is. Some say she asked them to help find her head, while others claim that she has found it and carries it in her arms, in which she just asks them to bury it with her body. If you're brave enough to visit the area, be sure to bring a friend, as it's said that you should never visit the headless nun alone. Number 9. The Baldoon Mystery The Baldoon Mystery takes place in the Baldoon settlement near present-day Wallaceburg in southern Ontario. This is where a group of Scottish families settled but faced many
many difficulties due to the swampy land and disease that was roaming the area. Among the original settlers, there was the McDonald family who showed much struggle beginning in 1829. According to accounts, this first incident happened when poles from the roof structure of the barn began to topple towards the ground, sending these deadly wooden daggers flying and sticking out of the ground. No probable source for the incident was ever found, and the poles were installed in such a way that they couldn't easily come loose, leaving the possibility of an unseen force with ill intent. As the strange occurrences continued to plague the farm, unexplained sounds would be heard from the McDonald family at all hours of the day and night. The family would often hear the sounds of footsteps throughout the house, but especially in the kitchen, which sounded like the rhythmic marching of many men preparing for war. But when the family went to investigate, the noises would abruptly stop, leaving no explanation for them. Another disturbing incident involved one of their children, a baby sitting in a wooden cradle, which suddenly started to rock violently from side to side, despite the efforts of three men there to stop it. And it didn't stop there. Rocks were thrown in the exterior of their home each and every single day, which would sometimes shatter windows. As well, fires would show up around the property as if someone was trying to burn down the place, but they would be so random that they didn't even look like it was intentional. They would attribute the hauntings to a witch who cursed the home and the land, and would later enlist the aid of a woman who told them to make a bullet out of silver and shoot a black feathered goose which would ultimately end the curse. After doing just that, they no longer had any more disturbances and we can say that the curse was finally lifted. Number eight, Oak Island. The Oak Island mystery is a series of stories explaining about a buried treasure and unexplained objects that have been found on or near Oak Island in Nova Scotia. Theories about the artifacts present on the island range from pirate treasure to Shakespearean manuscripts to the Holy Grail or even the Ark of the Covenant. Various items have surfaced over the years that were found on the island, some of which have since been carbon dated and found to be hundreds of years old. However, no significant main treasure site has been found there. The site consists of digs by new numerous individuals and groups of people, and the original shaft known as the Money Pit was dug by early explorers. A curse on the treasure is said to have originated more than a century ago, stating that seven men will die in the search for the treasure before it is found. And so far, there's been six deaths confirmed, with the most recent one coming from 2014. So we're really just waiting for the seventh one. Doesn't that sound terrible? Attempts to remove the water from the money pit have been unsuccessful and theories about an elaborate drainage system from the ocean beaches to the pit have been proposed. However, a scientific study conducted by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in 1995 concluded that the flooding was caused by a natural interaction between the island's freshwater lens and tidal pressures in the underlying geology, refuting the man-made tunnel theory. Regardless, Oak Island is a mystery that we may never be able to solve unless someone is willing to risk their life just so we can get that seventh death. Again, that sounds absolutely terrible. Number seven, Pit Lake's Lost Gold Mine. Pit Lake's Lost Gold Mine is a legendary lost mine said to be near Pit Lake, British Columbia. The supposed wealth has held the imagination of people worldwide for more than a century. The story of Pit Lake Gold begins in 1858, the year of the Fraser Canyon Gold Rush, where a number of maps were published in San Francisco promoting the gold fields of British Columbia. The mysterious riches are known as the Slough Mitch's Lost Mine or the Lost Creek Mine. Ever since the years of the Fraser Canyon Gold Mine, prospectors and adventurers have been looking for the mine and Gold Rush rumors have evolved into legends repeated and enriched over time. The mine was said to be located on the north side of Pitt Lake where an Indian brought quote a good prospect of gold which he states he found in a little stream on the north side of Pitt Lake to New Westminster creating great excitement in the city. Despite many expeditions to find the mine, it remains a legend with many different variations of the story. Some say that it was found by a Native American while others say a white man named Walter Jackson who before he died wrote a letter to a friend describing the location of the mine and and the treasure, describing it as yellow with gold and millions practically at the surface. Even after a century of searching, the mine remains undiscovered, which just adds more to its allure and its overall mystique. In the hump red list, we have the ghost ship of Northumberland Strait. The ghost ship of Northumberland Strait is a legend steeped in centuries of Canadian ghost lore. According to the legend, the ghost ship is a beautiful schooner with three or four masts, all adorned with pure white sails. This ship sails ablaze within the Northumberland Strait, which is a body of water that separates Prince Edward Island from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. The legend dates back at least 200 years and it is said that the ship appears before a northeast wind and is a forewarning of an extreme storm. Over the years, there have been numerous sightings of this ghost ship with people describing the distinctive outlines of the ship's mass and Phantom crew members climbing them before the vessel supposedly either completely burns, sinks, or just vanishes out of thin air. In 1900, a group of sailors boarded a small 
rowboat in Charlottetown Harbor and race towards the Phantom ship in order to rescue the crew only to have the ship vanish. Then in January 2008, a 17-year-old claimed to have seen the legendary Phantom ship in Tatamaguchi Bay, describing it as a bright white and gold ship. While the legend of the ghost ship has captivated the imagination of many, some have offered natural explanations for the phenomenon. In 1905, a New Brunswick scientist proposed that the legend may have arisen due to the natural electrical phenomenon known as St. Elmo's Fire that has been subject to the interpretation as the flaming rigging of a ship. Other explanations suggest that the illusion may have been created by a bank of fog which is just reflecting moonlight. But really, what do you guys think about it? In the hump of our list, we have the La Chasse Galerie. La Chasse Galerie, also known as the Bewitched Canoe or the Flying Canoe is a popular French Canadian tale of lumberjacks from camps working around the river of Gatineau who make a deal with the devil. The tale has roots in the French legend about a rich nobleman named Gallery who loved to hunt so much that he refused to attend the Sunday Mass. As punishment, he was condemned to fly forever through the night skies, chased by galloping horses and howling wolves. When French settlers arrived in Canada, they swapped stories with the natives and the tale of Gallery was combined with a First Nations legend about a flying canoe. The story goes that after a night of heavy drinking on New Year's Eve, a group of voyagers yearned to visit their sweethearts who were 100 leagues or 500 kilometers away. The only way to make such a long journey and be back in time for work the next morning is to run the Chase Gallery, which means making a pact with the devil so that their canoe can travel through the air to make their destination quickly. However, the travelers must not mention God's name or touch the cross of any church steeple as they whisk by in the flying canoe or else the devil will take their souls. The men promise not to touch another drop of rum and take their places in the canoe, which begins to rise off the ground. They start to paddle and soon pass over the frozen Gatineau River, many villages, and even the lights of Montreal. They eventually touch down near a house where New Year's Eve festivities are in full swing, and they finally spend time with their sweethearts and still manage to get back in the morning. Although this is a sweet idea, I don't know if I would make a deal with the devil in order to just get to a destination faster. Number four, the legend of Rose La Tulip. The story of Rose La Tulip is a French Canadian legend that has been passed down for centuries. This eerie tale tells the story of a young and carefree girl named Rose La Tulip who loved nothing more than just to dance. On the night of Mardi Gras, a mysterious stranger appeared at the La Tulip house and asked to dance with Rose. Without hesitation, Rose accepted the offer and danced with the stranger until the stroke of midnight. However, as the clock struck 12, the stranger revealed his true identity as the devil. According to some variations of the legend, the devil disappeared into the night, taking Rose with him to eternal damnation in hell. Others claim that the priest of the village intervened, saving Rose from the devil's grasp. Regardless of the outcome, the legend says that Rose would later enter a convent and die a few years after. This legend is one of the many examples in French Canadian folklore of girls dancing with the devil. These stories have been used as a cautionary tale for young girls, warning them of the dangers of dancing with strangers, particularly during Lent or on Sundays. The legend of Rose La Tulip is a chilling reminder of the consequences of succumbing to temptation and the dangers that can lurk in the shadows, even on on the happiest of occasions. Number three, the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel. The Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel has been supposedly haunted since 1888. One of the most famous ghosts seen at the hotel is the Ghost Bride, who is either seen on the main staircase or in the hotel's ballroom. The Ghost Bride story goes that on her wedding day, something startled her so bad and caused her to slip and fall. Some say that her heel got caught in her dress or that her dress just got caught in a candle's flame and went up and engulfed her. Whichever story is true or not, what is known is that she passed away on that very staircase. Ever since, hotel staff and visitors claim to have seen the veiled figure walking up and down the stairs every single day. And on the on the other hand, others claim seeing her in the ballroom dancing since she has never had the chance to dance with her husband. Man, this has to be one of the worst wedding disasters ever. Number two, the Old Finch Avenue Bridge. The Old Finch Avenue Bridge is a Bailey Bridge in Toronto that dates back to late October 1954. Ever since it was built, residents in the town of Scarborough have claimed it to be the most haunted bridge in the country. The most common legend about the bridge involves the disembodied screams of a young girl. The story goes that as you walk over the bridge at night, you may be greeted by shill screams from beyond. There are variations of the legend, each providing different suggestions about how you can prompt the noises. Some say you simply need to be passing over the bridge at the right time of night, just as the sky is darkest. Others suggest that you should go to the center of the bridge and start singing the song, Happy Birthday. A few people have remarked that you should yell happy birthday candy out into the darkness. However you choose to conjure up the potential spirit, the results are often the same, a high pitch and blood curdling shriek. But their experiences don't stop there. 
Pedestrians gathering up the strength to venture onto this bridge have heard footsteps, whispers, and strange noises. Some people have even reported feeling a cold, eerie presence while walking on this bridge, and this is why many people try to avoid this bridge at all costs to this day. Number one, Mussy. The legend of Mussy and the mysterious creature said to reside in Muskrat Lake in Ontario has captivated locals and visitors for decades. Described as anything from a walrus to a three-eyed Loch Ness monster creature, the origins of the legend are said to date back to 1960 and some even claim that it was mentioned by Canadian pioneer Samuel de Champlain in the early 17th century. Mussy's name is a diminutive form of the name of its reported location, which is a large and deep lake near the village of Cobden. The lake is also home to another paranormal phenomenon where local legends say that an atomic energy of Canada bus driver saw an extraterrestrial spacecraft landing on a spot atop a hill and leaving here. There is indeed a dark colored circular outline on this hill where grass does not grow with no widely accepted cause. Residents have variously described Mussy's physical appearance as a walrus, a sturgeon, or another fish, or even a Loch Ness monster with three eyes with sharper teeth. Some claim that a single very old Mussy or a member of its species arrived in the area then covered by the ocean about 10,000 years ago and that glaciers and later solid land masses built around it forming the lake and trapping the creature in it. Despite several attempts to find concrete evidence of this creature, including a search by author Michael Braley and friend Deanna Bean using sonar technology, scientists have surveyed the area and just found nothing. However, the definitive non-existence of a musty like creature is difficult to establish because some of the trenches in Muskrat Lake extend over 600 meters. So that's just food for thought when you're there. Number 10, Stull Cemetery. Stull Cemetery, located just outside of Lawrence, Kansas, has gained a reputation for being one of the seven gates to hell. According to urban legend, the devil himself appears in the cemetery on Halloween and the spring equinox at midnight. The legend began with a student publication at the University of Kansas that reported several student encounters with mysterious forces at the graveyard. As the legend gained more popularity, more and more people began showing up to the cemetery to witness the supposed supernatural activity, but this instead caused significant damage and vandalism to the graves and the crumbling church in the area. In response, a chain link fence and patrols were put into place to prevent any sort of trespassing. Then in 1999, reporters and a camera crew even showed up on Halloween day to investigate the truth behind the tales, but they're escorted off the property before the alleged appearance of the devil. Ever since, this place has remained a very significant spot in the state and many people still visit it to catch a glimpse of the devil that supposedly roams the grounds. Number 9, The Ghost of Saline River The legend of Takaluma is a frightening tale that has been passed down for generations in Kansas. According to the legend, Takaluma was an old Native American who was condemned to wander the banks of the Saline River after his death. His ghost is said to roam the river at nights, searching for his father's skull, who was the chief and was murdered by early settlers. One night, a cowboy camping on the riverbank had a terrifying encounter with the ghost of Takaluma. The cowboy heard a loud yell and saw the ghost standing right in front of him. He described it as a powerful looking Indian with piercing eyes and a very mocking laugh. Despite trying to defend himself with his revolver, the cowboy's bullet seemed to have no effect on the spirit. Takaluma then spoke to the cowboy in English, telling him a story of his people and their journey to the valley where they made their home. However, a pestilence decimated the entire tribe and their wigwams decayed. Then he described how the white man came and disturbed the rest of Takaluma's people with his plow. The ghost then asked the cowboy to help right the wrongs that had been done to his people and to find the skull of his father. However, some say the cowboy never ended up finding the skull, so Takaluma's spirit still wanders around the Saline River asking people to find the skull of his father. Number 8, the Rocky Ford Bridge. The Rocky Ford Bridge is a single lane iron truss bridge in Kansas that holds a dark and tragic history. Built between the years 1890 and 1907 in the stockyards of Emporia, the bridge is known for its historical significance and architectural style, which was popular in Kansas at the end of the 1800s. However, it is the murder of Sandy Bird that took place under the bridge in 1983 that has cemented its place in local folklore. It started when Thomas Bird, a Lutheran pastor, and his mistress, Lorna Anderson, planned to have their spouses killed. And later on, Sandy Bird's body was found on July 17, 1983, next to her car under the Rocky Ford Bridge. And alongside Lauren Anderson's husband, Marty, who was shot alongside a highway near Junction City. Thomas Bird was named an accessory in the murder of Marty Anderson and was later charged with the murder of his wife as well. The trial surrounding the murder drew national attention to the town of Emporia and the Rocky Ford Bridge. And ever since, many have visited this bridge due to saying that her screams can be heard at the bottom of the bridge during some nights. Others have also said that her ghost walks the shore and the reports ended up being so common the incident turned into the film titled Murder Ordained. Number 7, Nick the Ghost at the University of Kansas. 
Kansas State University's Memorial Stadium is home to a rumored ghost named Nick the Ghost. According to the legend, Nick was a former football player who died in an old cafeteria beneath the stadium, and now he haunts the Purple Mask Theater. Some people claim to have seen a white, hazy shadow lurking behind curtains, or to have experienced some strange occurrence like knocked over equipment and slammed doors during late night rehearsals. However, there may be another explanation for the ghostly activity at the stadium. Instead of Nick, the spirit could be that of Edward D. Eddie Wells a popular student at Kansas State and an accomplished athlete as well. It is believed to be him because when the United States entered World War I, Wells joined the military and was stationed on the Western Front. Unfortunately, he was killed on the field of battle on September 12, 1918. He was one of the 48 Kansas State students who died in the war and it is possible that Wells' spirit returned to Memorial Stadium, which is a place that he loved and that held many memories for him. Number 6. The Eldridge Hotel The Eldridge Hotel in Lawrence, Kansas has a storied history that dates back to the mid-1800s. This was when the building was burned down twice during the Missouri-Kansas border war. Originally called the Free State Hotel, it was built in 1855 by settlers from the New England Emigrant Aid Society as temporary quarters for those waiting for their homes to be built. However, just months after its construction, the hotel was attacked and destroyed by Sheriff Samuel J. Jones and his posse, who were pro-slavery forces. As a result, many people perished and ever since, the hotel has had run-ins with the supernatural. After being rebuilt back in 1865, the hotel was renamed the Hotel Eldridge and became one of the most finest hotels west of the Mississippi River. It was renovated in 1925, but by the 1970s, it fallen back into disrepair and was in danger of being demolished as many visitors would take their own lives and the town of Lawrence would undergo many fatal events. So now this hotel is recognized around the state as being extremely haunted and this is not that surprising. Surprising. Many visitors say the fifth floor is said to contain the portal to the spirit world, especially room 506. In this room, witnesses have reported breath marks on recently cleaned windows, doors opening and shutting on their own, and lights turning on and off by themselves. Others report cold spots throughout the old hotel, while some guests have even encountered apparitions on the fifth floor, and also some recall an elevator ghost that likes to open and close elevator doors on the fifth floor but that doesn't seem that scary, but more so helpful for those people. In the hump of our list, we have the Zombie Road. Zombie Road has gained a reputation for being the most haunted road in Kansas, and with a name like that, is it all that surprising? The writ originally known as Lawler Ford Road was built in the late 1860s to provide access to the Merrimack River and the adjacent railroad tracks. It was abandoned and fell into disrepair in the 1950s and then became a popular spot for local teenagers to hang out and party. However, the road's secluded location and eerie atmosphere led to numerous stories about ghosts, vanishing, and strange noises, earning it the nickname Zombie Road. One popular legend is that of the Zombie Killer, which is about a man who lived in the woods and attacked young lovers. Other sightings on the road include Native American spirits due to the fact it is apparently built on Native American burial grounds, so you already know how that works. Others here report a trans Lucent figure in white that is believed to be the ghost of Della Hamilton McCullough. She was a woman that was hit by the train and passed away in 1876. And ever since, people have reported seeing her spirit walk alongside the railroad tracks during some nights. The road has also have been the site of frequent derailments and all sorts of other accidents, leading to speculation that the ghost haunting the area may be only the people who suffered tragic accidents here. And this is definitely a sign never to drive on this road. Number four, Sawyer Castle. The Sawyer Castle is a beautiful piece of architecture that is rumored to be haunted by each and every one of its former residents. The castle was designed by Asabib Cross and built all the way back in 1873. It was later occupied by the Sawyer family, who experienced several untimely deaths in the home, including many people taking their lives, natural causes, and also one case of a child drowning in the swimming pool. These deaths have contributed to the rumors of ghosts on the property, and even those who venture around the property claim to see these spirits in the yard and sometimes looking through the windows of the castle. In the 1980s, one of Anton Sawyer's descendants purchased the castle but has done little to maintain it and it is now in a state of disrepair and listed for sale at the hefty price of $10 million. Despite its dilapidated state, the castle's creepy appearance and ghostly reputation has only added to its charm. Well, that's only if you're into haunted castles and such. But hey, if you got $10 million lying around, go and buy this castle just for the sake of having a haunted castle. Because why not? Number three, Fort Leavenworth Cemetery. Fort Leavenworth Cemetery in Kansas is filled with headstones of thousands of soldiers. So you kind of already know what that means. This means that it is haunted by many spirits who have never found peace in the afterlife. The cemetery, which covers 36 acres, has graves dating back to 1844 before it eventually even became a cemetery. 
Visitors to the cemetery have reported seeing ghostly soldiers, some of whom are injured and very confused. One such soldier is a young man in a Union uniform who is missing much of his face. Another ghost is said to be that of Chief Joseph, a Nez Perce leader who was held as a prisoner of war at the fort for eight months in 1877. He is said to haunt the cemetery out of grief and just straight bitterness. As well, Catherine Rich, a woman who searched for her missing children at the fort, later died of pneumonia. And she is also said to haunt the cemetery, carrying a lantern and calling for her children at all times. And that doesn't stop there. One more. The ghost of General George Armstrong Custer, who was court-martialed at the fort in 1867. He's been seen at the cemetery, kneeling at various gravestones as if he's in prayer and asking for forgiveness. Number two, Strawberry Hill. Strawberry Hill is a historic mansion located in Kansas City, Kansas that has a reputation for being haunted. Built in 1887, the house was purchased in 1919 by the Sisters of St. Francis Christ and then was converted into an orphanage called St. John the Baptist Children's Home. Today, the house serves as a museum thanks to the effort of the Strawberry Hill Ethnic Cultural Society. However, it seems that the building's history as an orphanage has left a lasting impression on the property. It is said to be haunted by several ghostly figures. One of the most well-known ghosts at Strawberry Hill is known as the Lady in Red, a woman who is said to roam the corridors of the house dressed in 1940s style clothing that trails blood. According to the legend, she was a woman who was taken in by the nuns at the orphanage, but later on she passed away after a failed abortion. Visitors to the museum and tour guides have reported seeing the Lady in Red walking through the chapel. And even two nuns even claim to have encountered her on separate occasions. In addition to the Lady in Red, there have been also reports of a male ghost haunting the third floor of the house. He's usually accompanied by several childlike ghosts playing in the halls with him. Paranormal activities such as phantom singing, chanting, and flickering lights have also been reported at this mansion. While it may not be the most welcoming place for the living, it seems that Strawberry Hills is a popular destination for the spirits of the deceased. Number one, Wolf Hotel. The Wolf Hotel in Ellenwood, Kansas is a historic location that is said to be haunted by various ghosts. The hotel is known for its underground tunnels that were once home to brothels, bars, gambling houses, and all sorts of other businesses. Today, the tunnels are closed to the public, but visitors can still take a tour of the hotel and its underground storefronts. Some people have reported experiencing strange sounds, moving shadows, and paranormal activity in the hotel, including ghosts that seem to interact with equipment. While down under in the tunnels, people have been physically grabbed with nothing to show for it. The hotel even offers regular tours of the property, as well as paranormal-focused tours for those interested in the supernatural. If you ever want to get a glimpse of these dark tunnels, just search up the Wolf Hotel tunnels on YouTube and you'll see many people using Dybbuk boxes and Ouija boards while they're walking down here. At our number 10 spot, we have the Sinaloa Cartel. This one I had to mention first because this is the most notorious and one of the largest drug trafficking organizations in the entire world. The Sinaloa Cartel was founded in 1989 by Mexican smugglers Hector Salazar, Juan Moreno, and the more famous Joaquin Lora, otherwise known as El Chapo. Their drug operations were so international that El Chapo was once ranked as one of the richest men in the world with an estimated net worth of $26 billion. This cartel group would eventually have the largest smuggling operation to the US with several different narcotics. To join the group, you would either need to be related to another member or be married to one. But once you're in the group, you would have to be on a constant watch for other rival gangs as the Sinaloa cartel engages in many turf wars. For example, in 2012, they had a bloody bout with the Juarez cartel over some territory. More recently in 2022, a Sinaloa leader took the lives of some priests and US tourists, making them feared internationally still. Regardless of El Chapo's imprisonment, this drug cartel group remains Mexico's most dominant drug cartel. At a number nine spot, we have the Jalisco New Generation. This is one of the youngest cartel groups on this list, but don't let that deceive you from the fact that they are also considered to be one of, if not the most powerful and violent cartel in Mexico today. This group first emerged after former Sinaloa cartel Ignacio Coronel, aka Nacho, was killed by Mexican security forces in 2010. So prior to his passing, he gave his orders to the leader of the millennial cartel, El Lobo, which were to move a load of drug shipments and manage finances. The name Jalisco is from the place where they operated from. This group is just known for their violent behavior. The group claimed they have committed a massacre in 2011, which involved 35 people in Veracruz, Mexico. And in more recent news, the group has uploaded videos online where new members were forced to eat the body parts of their enemies. So they're one of the more dangerous cartels on this list. At a number eight spot, we have the Beltran Levia organization. This Mexican cartel was founded by four brothers, Marcos, Carlos, Alfredo, and Hector, all under the last name of Beltran Levia. They actually served in the Sinaloa area and acted as extra security and enforcers for their cousin El Chapo. They would later relocate into the Gulf Cartel 
cartel territory after the leader had been arrested in 2003. At this point, they had many bouts with the Gulf cartel, who were accompanied by the Zetas, who were these soldiers recruited straight out of the Mexican military. When their commander Alfredo was apprehended based on the information supplied by El Chapo, it triggered them and the BLO split from the Sinaloa cartel. And instead, they joined their former rivals, the Zetas. War then started with El Chapo's son, Edgar Guzman, being the first victim, being shot to death in a shopping mall in Sinaloa. One by one, the brothers of BLO were being arrested, kidnapped, or even assassinated. This loss of leaders and alliances would cause the end of this group in 2017. At a number seven spot, we have the Gulf Cartel. We just mentioned this earlier, so let me give you guys a bit of the inside of them. This cartel is one of the country's oldest operating drug cartels. It was originally founded by Juan Guerrero in 1920s. Juan would smuggle alcohol in the US as the prohibition was in full effect. Except when this ended, he took up the challenge of smuggling narcotics to taunt other cartels. Then after he passed away, his nephew Garcia Abrego took over and made this group into something bigger. He would deal with various cartel groups to increase his power and influence in the area. He would later be pulling in billions after he would handle narcotic shipments through the borders, taking all sorts of risk in the process. Well, this caught up to him because in January 1996, he was arrested and transported to the US. The cartel even had to send billions of dollars to him using suitcases, jets, and through underground tunnels. This cartel still sticks around to this, but has lost a lot of former territory due to rival gangs. At number six spot, we have the Los Zetas cartel. On this list, we have some of the most evil cartels but the Los Zeta cartel takes the whole cake. The Los Zeta cartel was originally founded in 1997 and were made up of Mexican military deserters with many of them specializing in combat. This group was notorious for their extremely violent tactics and strict relationship between one another. Even the US Drug Enforcement Administration or the DEA described them as quote, the most technically advanced and sophisticated and violent of these groups. After its original use in the Gulf Cartel, they broke away in the mid 2000s and continued their drug smuggling and brutal executions. They were known for constant beheading and torture videos as they tried to strike fear into the eyes of their rivals. They really just didn't care about human life and they also caused a lot of political and police corruption whichever place they resided in. Right in the hump bar list, we have the Guerreros Unidos. In 2010, two groups of the La Familia cartel joined and formed the alliance with various cartels, giving rise to the Guerrero Unidos. One group decided to support Yeras, Tijuana, and the Los Zeta cartels. Then a second group decided to form partnerships with the Gulf and Sinaloa cartels. The group that sided with the Gulf and Sinaloa cartels would then form this GU group. In 2014, this cartel kidnapped 43 students from a college in Guerrero. Their influence was so strong they managed to get Mexican soldiers to interrogate these students only to send them off to the cartel members. The GU's violent tactics and use of kidnapping as a source of revenue made them a target of both national and state security forces. The group has lost several leaders and dozens of members as a result of these security operations. On top of that, this group also controls all sorts of government positions with constant bribes and the fear they instill on Mexican citizens. At a number four spot, we have the Yerez Cartel. This cartel was created in 1989 when smugglers had left the rival cartel, the Guadalajara. This group centers themselves of the profit from drug smuggling, but recently they have ventured into other criminal activities such as kidnapping for ransom money, human trafficking, and extortion. It wasn't until the group was under leader Carrillo Fuentes where they started to grow very, very quickly. Their operations went from local to Central America into South America, including including Argentina and Chile. They would use commercial and parcel air flights to smuggle in narcotics, which would later coin him the name Lord of the Skies. To this day, the Juarez cartel is battling with rival groups, barely clinging onto their territory. In November 2019, this cartel was linked to a brutal massacre of nine dual US Mexican citizens very close to the border. At number three spot, we have the La Familia cartel. The La Familia cartel first emerged in the 1980s as an anti-crime group, but as turf wars were happening everywhere at once, they got dragged into the Gulf cartel cartel and Zeta issues. Oddly enough, this group opposed the use of narcotics at first. I mean, their second leader, Moreno Gonzalez, apparently had his soldiers carry around Bibles and conduct prayer sessions before work. So maybe this group wasn't all bad. Well, this was until they discovered how profitable narcotics are. So over time, they found locations to grow their array of narcotics to distribute. Now they are Mexico's largest producer and exporter of methamphetamines and is racking up millions of dollars for this. At number two spot, we have the Tijuana or the Arellano Felix Cartel. The Orlando Felix Cartel, or the AFO, often referred to as the Juana Cartel, is one of the most powerful and aggressive drug trafficking organizations operating from Mexico. The Orlando family is composed of seven brothers and four sisters. 
Ramon is considered the most violent brother and organizes and coordinates protection details over what he exerts absolute control. In this cartel, they directly influence law enforcement and the judicial system in, in Mexico, as well as mass transportations of narcotics into the United States. The Tijuana cartel is presented in at least 15 Mexican states with important areas of operations in Tijuana, Mexicali, Tecante, Ensenada, and Baja California. At number one spot, we have the Nueva Plaza Cartel. The state of Jalisco is home to the Nueva Plaza Cartel as well, also known as the Cartel Nueva Plaza. Enrique Sanchez Martinez, aka El Cholo, and Eric Valencia Salazar, aka L55, were charged in the organization when it first formed as a breakaway faction of the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. This cartel started in 2018 and was financially supported by the Sinaloa Cartel, and this caused many fatal clashes between them and the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. In March of 2021, El Cholo appeared in a video claiming he had reached a deal with Mexico City Security Chief Omar Garcia Harfew to combat the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. Less than four Four hours later, El Cholo was found dead, his body covered in plastic on top of a park bench in Jalisco. Among other things, this cartel specializes in money laundering, extortion, arms trafficking, making them a strong cartel among those on this list.